So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers, the first TTT of 2014, uh, January 8th, 2014, and uh, we've invited uh, some people who showed some passion and showed some interest and um, to continue a conversation that we started at the end of last year um, around this New York Times article on design. Um, and um, homeless children in general, and or, I don't know how to say it, but we could extend that to young people who are challenged in different ways and what it's like being their teachers and um, however we can go here. Um, I really Please. love the fact that we have, hi Chris Sloan, welcome, that we've been able to invite people that I don't think you guys know each other, so I'm really happy to introduce you all to each other, but of course I'll let you do that. Um, Al, do you want to start since you're an A and you're right there on my screen, so then we'll just uh, go across. <laughs> certainly. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Al Elliott. I'm a uh, fifth grade teacher um, in uh, Hoover, Alabama. It's, it's near Birmingham. I uh, teach fifth grade. Uh, Self-contained. This is my I think, 17th year teaching. Um, um, Technology enthusiast and uh, happy to be here. You, um, self-contained. What does that mean? Uh, in, instead of it being departmentalized, uh, I teach all subjects as opposed to uh, just okay. teaching math or science. Um, I am my students' teacher, uh, except for like music, art, um, the things you love, PE, right? <laughs> except for the just fun teaching. stuff. No, I I joke. I I can't. Yeah. Cool. Chris, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Are you guys back in yet? I can't tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, we just right got, uh, we started on Monday too, so I think a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. Right? Is everybody else back? Yes. Not yet. No, yeah, yeah. Well then. <laughs> Steph is back. We're back at <laughs> it. You can all hate me now for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Mary Beth, welcome. Hi. Introduce um, yourself, please. Yeah, I'm Mary Beth Whitehouse. I teach in New York City in the Bronx. I'm self-contained too, uh, and I teach mathematics to sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders. Right. And, and does self-contained in your case it, does it mean special ed too or not? Oh, well, most definitely. And does, yeah. to be put into quote unquote self-contained class, my students are either severely academically behind so that the curriculum has been modified greatly so that they can adapt but it wouldn't fit naturally into a general ed class or they have emotional uh, issues. And just to check, Al, yours, that's not how you're defining self-contained, is it or is it? No, I'm, I'm defining yeah. self-contained as instead of students having uh, a teacher to teach them math and then go to a different teacher to teach them language arts and then go to a different teacher to teach them social studies. All of their subjects is taught to them by me. Um, yeah. So there is some similarity. Yeah, cool. Great. And Marina, been a while since I've seen you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Marina and I teach fourth grade general ed in the Bronx as well. Yay. <laughs> And you actually, do you loop with your students or not? Or I have now? before. Um, this mm -hmm. year I have like a completely new bunch, but mm -hmm. I have before. Stephanie, you said we're jealous of you because you're not back yet. But when you go back, where will you be teaching? <laughs> <laughs> um, I teach writing at East Carolina University. And and Stephanie also, West Bucket, by the way. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes, Stephanie West Bucket. Um, and I'm also uh, associate director of the Tar River Writing Project. Um, and my teaching research um, activists or hacktivist interests um, are around participatory literacies, equity, um, and digital technologies. So break equity down for us since it seems to relate. <laughs> from what you just said. You know, that, that was absolutely, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons that the, the Dasani piece um, was so gripping for me, um, because for me it really um, exposes the tension, I think, between equity and accountability. Um, 
So we're we're constantly, you know, hearing this education buzzword of, of accountable, and and the Dasani piece really makes me ask: To whom are we accountable? Um, you know, are we accountable to students? Or are we accountable to standards? And that's something that, since I've read this piece, I just keep thinking through and wondering about, and and um, starting conversations with other folks about this. So I'm eager to do that with all of you guys tonight. So thank you all. Why don't we just keep going around and please? Uh, I don't want to, you know, be the center of this at all. So. Um, and just kind of give first impressions, and you know, if you've only gotten halfway through or something, that's okay. Somebody counted the words. <laughs> it was a, quite a long series, but I did finish it. I'm a slow reader, but I got there, and I actually loved the the way it begins and climaxes and, and ends and kind of thing um, in lots of different ways, but we can talk about that. Um, I, I should introduce, I um, maybe have, but I should introduce myself as a, also a teacher in the Bronx. Um, I teach at a, a, my name is Paul Allison, I teach at a new school that we're opening called New Directions Secondary School. And very much like um, Mary Beth described her students, our students, you know, um, have had stresses in their life in one way or another. Um, so, and some very specifically, very much like um, designing stresses. But, um, so, it had a kind of, Personal, like wow, that that feels like somebody I was just talking to <laughs> when when it came out um, to me. So that's kind of uh, my first impressions. Anybody else want to jump in with your first impressions or third or wherever you are about the articles? And then we'll. I don't have a planned set of questions here, folks. So <laughs> who wants to jump next here? <laughs> Uh, I'll go. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mary Beth. And, you know, it actually came up today in my school. On uh, Monday, we have an after-school meeting, and the focus of our after-school meeting was um, how we're going to be measured as teachers, evaluated as teachers. And they were talking to us about um, not that part of the of the um, evaluation which is based on test scores but they were talking to us about uh, accumulating artifacts that we could use to earn uh, earn points that's what we were talking about but I found myself at some point during the day looking at one of my students and thinking to myself should I cut bait on him because he's not going to earn me a lot of points on my mm -hmm. evaluation and when I was reading the Dasani piece I thought to myself this is a child that a teacher really needs to make an investment in. And in fact, when we were reading the article, I thought, wow, look at these teachers and the principal going back time and time again. But when you're pitted against your students, as opposed to walking next to them, then you start to see them in a different light. And I really, really resent being pitted against my students in the way that we're being measured. Because I see myself as a coach and and that I'm on, I will often say to kids, I'm on your side. We're working together on this. But I have a kid who's been absent, I'm going to say, 40 times this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm not on his side. I actually, every day I mark him off as absent, I'm like, well, there's another day he's going to hurt my test scores. There's another day he's going to hurt my test Hurt my test scores. Hurt my, I'm not taking the test. But because I'm measured by his performance. That's how I'm viewing him, and it it alters the way I see myself as an instructor. It's almost um, one of the things, like when I go to church and I try to rethink how my day went and my week went and I ask for forgiveness, it's literally one of the things that as a professional, as I'm reflecting on who I am as a professional, that I feel that I need to ask forgiveness for from whatever bishop is going to grant that to me and the, maybe the new chancellor was, uh, will absolve me, but... Um, it's the way that we're being measured is changing my relationship with my students, and I don't like it. Yeah, and, you know, and just to keep the article central um, for tonight's, uh, I don't think testing is mentioned anywhere, is it? 
Well, that's not the focus of the piece. No, I know, or, but yeah, and neither just, are the teachers. But I thought to myself, well, but was, there is a teacher focus, you know. Mm, it's not know. the focus. The teachers are not the focus of that. No, I know, I know, yeah. But I and I wondered to myself what it would be like if they asked the teachers, you know, what do you do with a student like this? How do you view them? Does it change your view of the student when you're working against people instead of with people? And you know, you can repeatedly say, please don't get into a fight, please don't get into a fight, but you're receiving maternal advice on the other end, which is encouraging someone to fight, which is not necessarily a positive thing in the classroom or will will aid their academic success. I, I just, you know, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Stephanie. I'm sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I, I think one potential response that, that we do see in the article is um, in, in the conclusion when the principal invites the mother um, to bring the, the smaller one, um, the smaller child of the yep. family in and to volunteer and to spend time in that space and, and you know, really tries to make some connections and partnerships, and you know, we don't we don't find out what happens there and, and if that works out. But that seemed to me to be such a a moment of hope, um, and I'm just wondering how how common is that, and and how do we? I mean, are we doing these things in our in our schools and our communities? Um, do we have the power to do them as teachers? Is that an administrative, only an administrative privilege? You know, and, and what do you guys think about about that sort of move um, to align and and um, as opposed to, to you know to to work with as opposed to to working against you know the families that you're serving? I don't know. I I think if I could just jump in, uh, I just think a lot of times uh, as as teachers um, and just as as people in on the like just like with the boots on the ground, like when we actually interact with you know a, a, a students that are, that are suffering with you know impoverished conditions, is is it's difficult to escape the reality that regardless of what you do or say or what have you, those are the conditions. Like that's a constant for that student, right? Like. The number one problem facing, I guess, education is poverty. I guess if, if you really like, in a nutshell, and so it it almost feels like there's more energy and, and effort into how to deal with impoverished children as opposed to how do we get rid of poverty, right? And so even like within like the article, the what's like the solution? Like, you know what I mean? I mean like uh. A child is able to excel in in, in an area uh, against all odds, be it you know athletics or art or or what have you. I think all of us know that the that the odds are stacked against them, just because of the the just the real conditions that they go home to every day, right? And so uh, the the honorable law of averages teaches us that they're probably not going to make it. You know what I mean? Like there, there, there are so many like in life is, and when I say they're probably not going to make it, I mean for every success story that you have of a kid that that's come from an impoverished situation, there are 150 or 200 at least that don't have a happy ending. And 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 so I think that um, it's just difficult as a teacher, like for me as a teacher, to ignore the human aspect of the kids. I know we can't solve all of their problems, uh, but is is different for me? It's impossible to ignore, you know. Like, I, I guess just like when uh, Mary, Mary, Mary Beth was saying, if 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 they're absent like 30, 40 days, how do you ignore how that affects you? How that affects their classmates? Um, even what that student is going home to, and then you, you I know sometimes I feel helpless in in certain situations. Where if you talk to a counselor, if you talk to a principal, you contacted parents, but you can't raise or you can't, you know, just hit a button and fix it. So I don't know. I mean, just like I guess overall the article, um, it was it's a powerful article. It's it's a it's a, it's a touching and and endearing story, but to me it just kind of talks around, um, like what do we do? Like how do you? How do you fix it? How do we fix it? How do we make sure the kids don't go home to that? You know? 
I, I don't know how I'm asking. Or like, to me, those those are the conversations. You know what I'm saying? That 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 I think would be, you know, like important to be a part of and to have. Um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe I was rambling. I don't know. But yeah. No, no, yeah, I, not at all. Thank, thanks for those contributions. Rob, I just, it, it's just like we don't have those answers either. Um, right. and, and maybe maybe there are other kinds of guests who might have those answers that we could invite another time. Um, but, we're, you know, but, but I do think, I hope that schools are, are some, some of the answer. You know, one of the... Um, Interesting conversations we had back in December was how schools. This was for um, kids in foster care, but how schools were both um, the most wonderful thing for students and the worst thing for students mm. at the same time. You know, so you know it was the place in their life that gave them some focus, but it was also the place where they felt the most depression and teasing and difficulty as well. So, yeah, I don't know. They're in school an awful long. These young people were in school an awful long time, so that's <laughs> we have some impact on their lives, obviously. But working with certainly working with families and figuring out how to work with families and not with individual students would seem to be part of the answer. It seems to me. Marina, do you have any first thoughts you want to jump in with? Um, I haven't read the whole article, but I was mm -hmm. reading it from like I started at seven thirty, and um, I'm like absolutely mesmerized by the whole thing. Um, I see so many glimpses of like things I would read. I'd be like, oh my gosh, this reminds me of this kid. This thing. There were so many, so many. It was like this big collage of children I've encountered in my um, career, and. Um, Getting back to like the teaching thing, though, I was really, really, I, I loved reading the parts about, um, I think her name was Miss Hester, mm -hmm. and there was one part where Dasani said that she makes her want to learn, and I think that, I mean, I, I don't know what a solution is, but I think the best thing that we can always do for any of these kids is just to try to let go of that piece where we're being put against them and that is so hard to do when it's like what you put into your job and now you're being measured that way with it but um, they, they just need they just need a reason to want to keep coming to school and and to just have somebody keep giving them something whether it's for the entertainment purposes whether it's for love for learning and um, I almost feel like that's my responsibility, you know, sometimes to dig a little deeper, to get a little closer to them in, in those ways and to just to, to get them to feel like there can be something more than what they're currently. Because I, I, I can't even imagine what their lives are like outside of the eight structured hours. At least I can try to give them that. Yeah. So I really found her to be very inspirational, Miss Hester. I liked her. Yeah. So, Mayor Beth, is there a way to, like, recognize and keep that anger, but also, I mean, you must, but also work with the young people. So how does that, how does that work for you? <laughs> I mean, because part of what I hope this conversation becomes even more as we go here is, is like, working with young people who are impoverished and challenged in this way, puts us, like, people don't quite get it, what it's like for us, too, you know? So getting our story out there feels important, but, yeah. Um, well, I, I've been, like, in the chat room, I'm talking, and it's, it's interesting because while they're busy trying to quantify teaching within some sort of framework, which seems gigantic, it's still not big enough because I'm wondering what are our responsibilities for advocating for public policies that eliminate or alleviate or eradicate poverty? So since we are, I guess we're not the front lines of poverty. Maybe we are because I'm not starving to death. And I have so much heat in my house right now, I've got my windows open. But <laughs> yeah. I've got students yeah, I know. I know what it's like. Yeah. Right. I, I've got students who came to school so they could have heat. Okay. Yeah. I've got students who couldn't come to school because they have asthma. 
which is part of the environmental poverty mm -hmm. that they suffer because of where they live. So what what since I'm right there, since I see it, since I live it every day, what are my responsibilities as an adult who sees who sees this in advocating for policies that would change a Dastani's life? And more importantly, for my students, how do I create them as actors? How do I help them become actors in the, in the creation of policies which affect their daily lives? And I used to be, I used to have more flexibility in doing that. And now with parameters around, like I gave benchmarks this week, and my students didn't do well on the benchmarks, and they want to know why my those are those are tests that those supposedly are prepare more them for tests. the state that's tests. My, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what my kids need: more tests. Okay, less instruction, more tests. Okay, and it, it is unbelievably frustrating. When what I would like to be doing, what we did, um, we took a week out of school to write letters to the mayor about issues that involved us, the new mayor. Mm. Well, there was more learning happening in that week than happened all the rest of the time because they were truly engaged in it. I had one group learning about, you know, stop and frisk and writing. A, one kid wrote this line. He wrote, why is it I know every teacher's name at my school, but I don't know the name of a single police officer? Mm -hmm. He said, if you want me to look at the police officers like they're part of my community, then why don't I know their names? What, what a powerful sentence that kid wrote to the mayor-to-be. But don't worry, none of that happened this week. I was very busy just testing my kids, you know. So in terms of like policy, educational policy, public policy around poverty, how are we getting our messages out there or contributing to the larger conversation so that people who do things about this stuff do things about this stuff instead of just saying zip code is not destiny like Michelle Rhee is famous for saying, but that doesn't help my kids. That doesn't put food in their belly. Or that doesn't keep them out of the police station at night when one parent hits the other. That doesn't make their apartment hot. That doesn't give them a coat. It, you know, that's those are the things I'd like to to see happening in my school and in my classroom. You actually bring up like a, a, a interesting point. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about is we actually posed the topic to uh, what is it? Uh, Ed Camp Home. Um, nobody entered my chat room, but this was my topic. Um, and 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 the the topic that I was I was interested in is. How how can we empower teachers' voices? And and I know one of the things that policymakers and the powers that be look at is research. So so how can we get teachers to to figure out or to be able to use some of the best practices that are associated with research to document the things that we know and share the information? I mean, it's 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 almost like a recipe. Like if, whether you're a chef or not, if you follow the recipe correctly, then you're gonna get a pretty good treat on the other end. So there, there, there are certain fundamentals about collecting research and writing up research and then disseminating that data to the audience that I think teachers at large don't know. And I think right now with tools like Google Plus, you know, Google Documents, not just to do a Google commercial, but just online sharing tools in general. I think it's the time for us to empower our voices and find those members of our PLNs that, you know, know how to um, you know define a situation as a case study or know that okay I'm going to do you know the qualitative research of you know impoverished students and you know what's really important to them and figure out how do we take what we're all experiencing turn it into a narrative that's easily digestible by the people that are somewhat removed from like I guess boots on the ground. I almost hate to use that analogy, but for the people that are they're right there touching and interacting with the kids, you know, firsthand. Um, and so uh, hopefully we can um, figure more of those things out. Um, I I actually think that the tide is changing. I think that there are so many um, like Paul Allison's out there. There, there. there are so many people out there that are finding like-minded individuals, bringing them together and putting their voices out there that it's becoming more and more difficult to ignore all of the messages that they're getting surrounding the same themes uh, regardless if, it, if the messages that hadn't been as refined as they are used to getting but I do think figuring out how to re refine our message uh, and make it more palatable to the powers that are making decisions um, I think is exactly the point like I, I, I do think that's what I, I am interested in working towards figuring out how to do that
So, Al, I have I have two suggestions on that. Um, the National Writing Project Teacher Inquiry Communities um, has a wealth of knowledge around teacher inquiry, writing up these narratives, sharing these narratives, and there's one particular book that's a free PDF download um, at nwp.org called Working Toward Equity, and um, that book has been, we've used it um, in several of our partnerships with high need schools and working with teachers to tell those stories, to collect that data, and to be able to speak back um, to the slick data, the slick ends, I guess you could say, um, that often um, speak to policyholders. Um, I, I think it's just a, a wonderful collection of um, sort of how-to and examples about teacher inquiry and what it means to get that message out. Um, and also there's, um, I, I've been thinking a lot recently about um, teachers as activists and, and as activists and what does it mean to be a hacktivist. So we have these curriculums, we have these standards. Uh, and as, I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, Mary Beth, as Mary Beth was, um, was saying, you know, we're, we're sort of held hostage to these, these curriculum and these standard systems. So how do we hack them uh, to do the kind of work we need to do for the real human bodies in our classrooms to meet the needs of the people who are in front of us? Um, and, you know, I think if we can learn more about what it, the different styles of organizing, um, of activist organizing, values-based organizing, interest-based organizing, issues-based organizing, I think we need to, to really do a lot as a profession um, to explore this idea of teacher as activist and, and, and work together to sort of think about what this might mean. Um, there's a great book for writing program administrators called um, The Activist WPA um, that talks about the stories and how we frame our stories um, to make stories sort of the tactics of organization. Um, and so I've, I've been sort of pushing at some folks at NWP to try to get a book group or something going around some of this work because I think it's absolutely necessary uh, for where we are right now as a country and as a profession. What was that last thing? Say it again. The yeah. Activist WPA. It's actually for writing program administrators. So the Activist Writing Program Administrator by Linda Adler Kastner. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a fantastic look. She worked with the Wellstone Group um, for a while and um, sort of really dug into what does it mean to organize and then how can educators, even though the audience is for higher ed writing program administrators, it really looks at how educators can um, you know, use these strategies, these tactics um, to really tell stories and to advance the work and, and the causes that, that matter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm impressed that in our conversations around teacher voice um, a, month, a few months ago at this point with Steve Zemmelman, for example, um, and when the issue of telling stories or, or, or working toward policy through unions and so forth came up, it seemed that the notion of organizing was really important, that it's not enough to tell your own story, that tell your story within an organization is important. I'm just wondering, so what would the organizing around the Dasani articles look like? Or, you know, or around poverty issues? Or is there already organizing that you can Hook us up with Mary Beth, or um, there's any uh, on Diane Ravitch has founded the Network for Public Education. Mm -hmm. um, they're having a conference, I think, near the spring conference time in Texas. Um, there's the Badass Teachers Association, known as the BATS, B A T, founded by Ma Professor Mark Nason at a Fordham. So if you're a New Yorker, that's kind of in our neighborhoods. Although the association is national and there are thousands of bats in, in every state. And if you're on Twitter, you can find uh, the Badass Teacher Association by doing a search. So, and Mary Beth, wait a second. Are you, are you a badass teacher? I am a badass teacher. <laughs> I am a badass teacher so, in more so, than one definition. <laughs> so, I love how do you... <laughs> I was hoping you were. No, but so how do you how do you see see like but, but the way you started felt almost felt I don't know I let me just put it out there but it feels like almost defeated like what can I do but you're a badass teacher so you don't you're not defeated so how do you move from that to you know from one to the other. I'm not. I'm definitely not defeated. I find mm -hmm. myself motivated 
by the anger that I feel. And I feel angry because, it, and I think it's perfectly highlighted in the Dasani story, the challenges of being a teacher are enormous and growing. Mm -hmm. They're definitely not shrinking. And, you know, we keep talking about a village, but it seems to me that a lot of times I'm the only motherfucker in the village, okay? <laughs> and and it shouldn't be that way. It should not it shouldn't be that I'm working against the parents. It shouldn't be I'm working against the kids. It shouldn't be I'm working against my colleagues. We should be a team surrounding these little human beings which as much with as much love and support and hope and caring as we can. And Instead of feeling defeated, I know all that sounds like a bunch of obstacles. That's the stuff that gets me going. Because when I get pissed off, that's when I start to do stuff. So um, I, don't, I don't know what I'm, I mean. Maybe that's a sickness. Maybe I should talk to my therapist about that. But I find that anger is very motivating for me. So, and it's the thing that will take me out with a sign when I'm standing in Albany with a big sign over my head, you know, demanding change. It what gets me on Twitter to like send articles out that support the idea that poverty is, as Al said, very difficult to overcome in a classroom. And, you know, I still live in the hope that I am a good enough teacher to make a difference in my, in my students' lives, but I also hope I understand that I'm not the only thing that should be making a difference right. and that I need to advocate for the village to step forward and do what the hell is their job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had a Chris, couple great. things. Yeah, Chris Sloan, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So first of all, there was a request from the chat room. There have been a lot of, uh, like Stephanie mentioned a lot of books, and then Mary Beth, you just mentioned a num you know, a few different organizations. Yeah. So they were asking maybe to, you know, uh, okay. get some links to those things, uh, you know, in the chat room. Okay. And then secondly, kind of what Mary Beth was um, just on about, um, you know, I read more and more like uh, Robert Reich and and people talking about income disparity growing and and some of you seem like you've been teaching for more than a couple years. Uh, and so, um, do you, it sounds like Mary Beth? Would you say this is getting worse? Like the kinds of kids you describe that you know can bring down test scores or you know that just need a lot of help. Uh, are there more of those? Is that your sense in the last few years, or is it the same amount? Is do you do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I my my yeah, I teach special ed, Chris. So that's an interesting question. I hmm. all the students in my classroom could bring down test scores. My problem isn't um my problem isn't that they bring down test scores or or don't. My problem is that I used to be able to reach those students at a place that I think made a significant difference in their lives. That I would talk to them about talents they had that lay outside their ability to, to do the mathematics in front of them. And now I'm pressured to only look at them as test-making machines. And, and that robs both of us of our humanity. But you don't let that happen, do you? I mean, <laughs> it happens on a daily basis where I have to smack myself and say, nope, okay. nope. Or the kid who you explain things to three different times, and he's the kid who still doesn't get it. And I'm looking at that kid like, do I cut bait here and move on? Or do I grab him at lunch? He's still not going to get it then. Or do and with this, the kid that I'm talking to you about, whose name, obviously not telling you, um, mm -hmm. I had to make a political decision to have, and this is a huge risk that I took, to talk to the parent about opting out of the exam, which is not a DOE sanctioned option. And it is not something I'm supposed to talk about as a teacher. And yet, I closed the door, I sent him out of the room, I had the mom there, I spoke to her about this kid crying on a weekly basis in my classroom, because he can see, there are his numbers posted for him to see for the school, to, because this is what we do. This is what we're doing now in classrooms. And to say to her, your child has a million talents, and mathematics is not one of them. That doesn't mean we give up. But he's not. he should not be doing this. I should not be stressing him out every day like this. 
you might want to think of doing a different option. Do you know that mother said yes before it was over? I gave her all the material. I said, it's your, your I get, found all these websites for her. You need to do the research. Da -da. The lady was like, you're right. Oh, my God, Mrs. Whitehouse, he comes home every day. It's terrible. And the blah, blah, blah. She's going to opt out. We're putting together a portfolio of work for this child so mm -hmm. that he can show his learning over time, where he started, where that's what all my students should have that blessing. By the way, I think de Blasio is moving towards more portfolio schools that show work over time, not just a single day, a single mm -hmm. test, where kids, this kid almost pees in his pants when he's tested. Yeah. What are we doing to our children? But I think well, ultimately, like, and, and not just to jump in, but what you're describing to me should be how it is. Like, you are the professional. Like, it's, it's, it, it, it always has, has been amazing to me, it seems like, in, in education especially, like, the teachers are simply just not considered as much as I think they should be when determining how the profession behaves. You know, like doctors have conferences where they listen to other doctors to decide how the medical profession is going to move forward. Uh, lawyers uh, use different, you know, law cases to have, you know, to set certain precedents about how lawyers are going to act and behave and move forward. Teachers overall, to me, are, are ultimately ignored because I'm, I'm, I've spoken with several educators uh, and most of the time I agree or I am able to be more easily convinced by an educator that has, has told me about you know their personal experiences or uh, their, their personal expertise what they actually think and and but I think that that voice or that expertise just doesn't have the same weight be, because of it's, it's just the teacher and, and and I think like um, even when, when I, I I'm not sure how everybody adopts their textbooks but I know it, in, in Alabama um, they have to be research-based programs Right, but if if everything that we're doing is research based because we 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 know how to do research, I think that 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 empowers teachers to say, okay, I'm not administering this test this way, or or I'm not going to do this this way because the research says, and the research could be the research you've done or people that you know that have done it firsthand in a more similar situation to to give you that professional leg to stand on against you know. Uh, the the superintendents and the national agendas that say, well, we've got research that says this is what a ten year old is supposed to be able to do with a number two pencil, you know. But I, I agree wholeheartedly that when 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 you know what you're talking about, to me, you, you you know what you're talking about. Like regardless of the letters that follow your name, or you know, regardless of you know who elected you into office, if you're a teacher and and and, and you believe in what you're doing, and and you know what you're talking about. Someone other than you know that one-on-one -on -one case that one parent should be listening to you. I'm listening, Mary Maribel. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, I want to ask about those of you teaching in states with teachers' unions. Do you feel more empowered? Um, I mean, we're here in North Carolina, and I know we've been all over the national news. Conditions here are, are deplorable at this point. Um, but I'm wondering for, for some of the rest of you, um, do you feel like your voice is being heard? Now, Al, I assume Alabama is not a unionized state. Well, we have the, the, the Alabama Education Association. That's, that's, that's our uh, teachers' union. But I, but I think ultimately, just what I've found, uh, teachers' union advocate what's best for teachers, which is not necessarily what's best for students. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when most of the time when I think of what's best for students, it's not necessarily what I would even like. I, I, I'll give you just one example. I would not want to arbitrarily have to teach a different grade, just like this year I teach fifth grade, next year I teach second grade, or what have you. But I do think as an elementary educator, it would be beneficial to students to have a teacher that is, you know, has experience teaching every level of the elementary spectrum. Um, if, if, if I've had years teaching first and second and third grade, then I had years teaching fourth, fifth, and sixth, I can kind of see on that continuum um, this is where this is the track I think kids should be able to go. This is what I think they'll be able to do, you know, socially, developmentally, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Uh, and so I think that would be like just that's just one example. That I think there's something that's best for kids. I think that's not necessarily good for teachers. And I think a lot of times teacher unions, they you know they're 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 trying to keep a teacher's job. 
and not necessarily trying to make sure that the students are getting the best and highest quality education possible. So that's what I think the kind of conflict of interest lies with most teachers' unions. That was an interesting example. Yeah. yeah. Mary Beth, what's your thought on union? You've, you've worked with the unions more, haven't you? Or? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's my experience with unions? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you want to say? Or if you don't have to, I was just saying. Let the bats out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, I can speak like in New York. Um, I'm not familiar with everything um, in other states, although uh, Randy Weingartner and I Twitter each other back and forth. Um, on a local level, the UFT has been kind of owned by the Unity Party. Um, I think that teachers might not even understand that the UFT has um, more than one party battling for control of the union. Because, and the reason I say people don't know that is most teachers don't even vote in the union election in New York. Okay, So less than 50%, which drives me crazy as a history teacher, um, that less than 50% of anything would vote. But in any case, um, and so they don't understand that they have choices other than the Unity Party, which is the one that uh, Mulgrew came in on and Weingarten before that. Um, but there is a party that I belong to <laughs> called the Moore Caucus Party, which is advocating um, kind of more far left positions than the Unity Party. From my position, I think the unions often cave into the pressure more than make voices of the teachers heard. As some of you have been advocating for, getting our voices out there is really important. But there's a, a lot of backdoor peddling that's happening, which is an always illustrative of what the rank and file want. So, um, but you know what? That's our fault. Because in Chicago, the rank and file have taken control of their union. And so when teachers step up and start actually getting involved and not just letting the guy who's been the union representative for 30 years continue to be the union representative, that's what you get. That's why Chicago has Karen Lewis, who's out there in the front, and they had a rather successful strike, you know, um, less than a year ago, and we don't. So mm -hmm. if we want control, then we need to take it back. Mm -hmm. I, could I throw the question back uh, here from New York to those of you who aren't in um, or, or more familiar with rural areas and so forth, perhaps, or wherever, Alabama, <laughs> North Carolina, um, and maybe Utah there. Like... Uh, is the story of Dizani, is Dizani's story a New York story? Is it an urban story, or is you know what what's what's it look like where you live um, with young people like this? Is that is it possible to answer that? <laughs> I don't think it's a New York story. Uh, I've taught in, in, in school systems that, that, that would be considered in, impoverished. I remember my, my, my first teaching job was is, is in a city called Bessemer, uh, and it was in what was called a community school. And the school was in the middle of, of well, at, at that time, what was the projects. Um, and there, there were no school buses. All of the kids walked to school. So you knew if your kid went to this school, they lived in the surrounding community. Um, and there were, there were several, like, challenges just on a – a day-to-day -day situation that they faced, uh, dealing with you know their their dope dealers in in you know in the neighborhood, their robberies, their murders, their gunshots, there's everything that you will find in any any impoverished area is there. Uh, and and there were successes. I I'll, I'll never forget. I I was the uh, the time the math math team coach. The name of the school was Hard. Uh, so our team was math the hard way. And I remember you know having fifth graders and sixth graders. Going to these math tournaments and we would we would win and we would come out victorious like several times um, and so that was just a, a, you know an example of kids being able to overcome poverty and excel and and go on to um, other great things so I don't think it's necessarily a, a story that's unique but I, I do think you know there there are more people in New York and there there are more people in Chicago than in in Bessemer <laughs> on the outskirts of Birmingham and so uh, it's, I think it's it's just a uh, uh, it increases the likelihood that, that those stories will get out first when they get out but I do think uh, it's been my experience of teaching a different system the kids are more alike than they are different even in so e even in the the systems that are quote unquote more fluent 
there there are always uh kids that have just learned how to put their game face on. They they have already figured out that the world doesn't care. So there's no need to come and, and put my heart on my sleeve and come say, oh, poor little me, I don't have this, I don't have that. They just really figure out how to adapt and survive and just continue to, to do that. But I, I don't think it's a unique New York scenario. I don't think. I don't, I don't think so either, Al. Um, I mean, I, I work in eastern North Carolina, and, and I'm in Greenville, which is sort of the micropolitan of the area with you know 70,000 here. Um, but, you know, I, I, I recognize Hassani and the kids we work with and the local high schools and the middle schools, um, you know, and, and she reminds me quite a bit of a young lady that I was working with last semester um, who was entrusted with the care of, of her three siblings. Um, she left school um, shortly after lunch. Um, she was determined to graduate, but it seemed all year long, every obstacle that you could possibly imagine, similar to Dasani's, dealing with homelessness, dealing with lack of health insurance, dealing with sicknesses that, that no one could address for her, um, you know, lack of a school nurse on site, because our, our um, county has a nurse that rotates between so many schools, you know, all of these issues and problems um, are stacked up against this young lady and, and many of the kids that I work with. Um, and so, you know, I think urban poverty and, and rural poverty looks different. Um, more isolation when you're working with, uh, you know, rural kids in poverty. Um, but but the key issues and, and the key problems are, are there. Um, and and the young people's faces I could I could see in Dasani's as I as I read that article. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, where I live in Utah, the unemployment rate is probably four percent, and so. Um, you know, we'd be tempted to say it's it's not as, you know, not as extreme as like Dasani's world, but uh, I think we're noticing that there are more and more Dasani's around here, and that was kind of my question uh, to Mary Beth a while ago, is is it everybody's sense that there are more people like Dasani in our schools that were there 10 years ago? And um, I mean, my thinking is, yes, even in my situation, which is, um, you know, again, it's it seems like things are the economy overall here is is okay, um, and and then I guess my my real question is, to what extent are our students getting their stories out there, and how do we help them do that? Like Dasani's story, one part that I was really intrigued by because I teach photography too is the on the lens blog, you know, there was another. Um, piece about um, Dasani just from the photographer's point of view and and it made me think more that. yeah I'll put a link in the chat room mm -hmm. um, and more and more it made me think of you know how hard is it to get um, our own students stories out there and, and wouldn't that be pretty powerful and and how we go about doing that and and I think about Paul's student that we talked to a few times John um, you know, for my kids, that was actually a pretty powerful thing just to talk to them. And, and then, you know, like, how do we get to that part where they then um, tell their stories to the greater public? Mm -hmm. I think now with the, uh, to me, I think that should be the ultimate purpose of the technology that we're able to integrate. I think overall, um, like right now, I guess, you know, many of my students are watching, we're studying energy. Uh, and, and one of the definitions that we use was the ability to cause change, of course, ability to do work. Well, energy and power are kind of synonymous. So how do you affect change? And one way is being able to articulate your story to a larger audience. And, and with, with YouTube and, and, and editing, and pictures, photography, being able to write and share, I, I think this is what all kids need to learn how to do as, as much as learning how to find the square root of 16. They should know how to, to, to recognize what's important to them is important and how do you get that importance out to uh, an audience larger than the people that you see. Yeah, and I think we're seeing in North Carolina um, a move, um, particularly in, in high schools, around um, digital media curriculums. What bothers me is many of these are, are sort of um, framed around industry standards, you know, certification, and so I'm thinking 
we've got to we got to take the opportunity to work with digital media and work with young people, but we've also got to hack that and make it not about industry standards, right. but about stories the kids have to tell. Right. That's correct. Mary Beth, uh, this gives me a chance to say th those those uh, letters to the mayor uh -huh. that your kids wrote, yeah. do you still have them? I and have is there any way to... S what? I have copies of them. Is there any way to send those to me? Yeah. yeah. We'll, uh, we'll talk. But okay. but there's a there's a channel on Youth Voices that, um, that we use and um, a wonderful video, actually, that Marina is the star of. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. um, about letters to the next mayor, but um, you've taken it to the next step, which is letters to this mayor. Right. Um, but so it would be so because I think I th getting those students' voices out there would be really exciting to do in some way um, for the students. And yeah. So, at any rate, I'll I'll follow up on that. <laughs> we'll talk. That makes sense. Um, could I? Could we spend the last? Uh, we have what seven or eight minutes here. I, I want to get back to the article if, if we can, and and just and, and I'm going to kick it off this way. Part of what I love about the about the series is is something about and and Chris the, the lens blog makes me think that I want to go check that out too, but. Um, it's something about the writing, like everything I want to teach in literature, and this is a little hyperbole, but let me just say it anyhow, um, I think is contained in these articles, right? There's like character and characterization. There's this, there's this amazing scene in the middle of the third one where everything is kind of building up to be okay and then everything falls apart. So there's this like climax that happens and then, you know, so it's just like, and there are five, you know, anyway, so it's even, even, so I just think it's really quite beautifully crafted and worth reading just to read, in addition to all the other issues we've brought up. But I just wanted to know if, if anybody else wanted to make a comment like that about the, like, why should somebody read this beyond all the great reasons we just gave here? <laughs> Did I end my question too fast? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You already sort of answered it in asking. Yeah. I know. That's what I do. Sorry. No, but I would say that there is like this there is this resurgence of long form journalism that um, that is a really it's a good example um, of yeah, yeah. Yeah, viable form that um, my students, you know, we're moving to that this semester, you know, the next couple of weeks, where um, you know, we've talked about how because we do a print publication too and and we tried for many years to kind of do the USA Today kind of thing. It's like, you know, oh, you you can only have a page and, and that's enough. And, um, you know, readers can't read that much. And, and then we're seeing, you know, really interesting kind of explosion of long-form journalism online, which I thought, you know, we wouldn't see. Um, there was that New York Times piece about the, the avalanche in Washington not too mm -hmm. long ago. Um, and it was a really long story that was online, um, Snowfall it was called. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is another example of like, yeah, this is uh, what we teach in the traditional short story unit, um, this kind of writing and, and yeah, we're exploring that long form journalism ourselves. I think, uh, I'm no medium.com, um, I think uh, one of the co-founders of Twitter has basically started a long form blogging platform. Like I think tr traditionally, like blogs are, are just geared to. I think Twitter kind of overdid it with the 140 characters, but most blogs are just relatively short. Uh, but but Medium is 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 a unique. Like I guess it, it, it's just they're longer articles, they're more in depth. Uh, it, it's a simple site. Uh, and and it's designed around sharing ideas and collaborating with other people that that basically write longer. So um, I think that there's there there's an appetite for more in depth and and more um, I guess I I, I want to say beautifully crafted um, written pieces as opposed to just informationally based because the article it, it is written. More of is it, 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 it's almost a um, I don't want to say it has like a certain entertainment quality to it, but but it has a it has a range. It's not just giving you information. It's not just saying this happened on this date, that happened on that date. Um, 
just like Paul, just like you you were bringing up. There there are climaxes, there are characters, there 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 are there are there issues are cinematic scenes, issues. right? Exactly, yeah. uh, and and that's something that I think is lost on the immediate. Give me a sound bite. Um, you know, what's the shortest way to give me the basis of the story type culture we we've, we've created? So yeah, that I think that is a a good reason to also read the article. Yeah, I'll be teaching research writing um, with first year students uh, next week, and I'm excited to to use this in in my classes as an example mm -hmm. of really engaging um, research based writing. Um, you know, and thinking about bringing in elements of nonfiction, um, you know, the characterization, like you were saying, the plot, the characterization, the pacing. The story has just wonderful pacing. Um, to make these research products that my students are, are writing viable, you know, to give them an audience, to give them interest, and to give them some legs to go beyond just, you know, an, ass an assignment in, in a particular class. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to use it and, and get folks into annotating it. I know Paul will be using sort of um, some of your, your stuff on your voice with annotating. Um, yeah, I, I did put the article up on Crocodile. Um, so oh, cool. Yeah, so if you, it's just youthvoices.net slash Dizani. Um, and I've tried to collect other things there, too, um, an interview with her on a local show and so forth. But, um, yeah, you know, in a day, but you, you mentioned it was a research class, right? So in addition, it's incredibly well-sourced. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, but they're like if you click on the link to see the sources, it's just amazing. Yeah, that was um, one of the how, things yeah, I was so, with. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, Marina, you have any thoughts here as we're kind of finishing? <laughs> well, um, I can't wait to finish it. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I, it's, you know, the true beautiful story about this amazing kid who's just going through, going through such a. I don't know. It's it's really beautiful the way it's written and the story. You know, it's it's life, and um, I just I keep I, I just want to know more about her. You know. Yeah. Did you all see that she was invited to the inauguration and held the Bible for the newly sworn in public advocate, and that there was some controversy around that because the public advocate apparently tried to take credit. At least in part for even the even the um, the beginnings of the article, like how the Times came up with it, and then the New York Times put out uh, a release saying, in no way had the public advocated con uh, advocate contributed to their writing of the piece. So it's kind of interesting yeah. that she's being used now as this political football to get you know people's attention. And my interest would be in what other ways is she going to be used, and by whom, for what purposes? And maybe and by us, too, you know? I mean, oh, we all have to be careful of that. Yeah. yeah. Is there I think any a good way to talk about the materiality of texts? You know, what what happens once it's released? You yeah. know, I think that's yeah. an interesting thing. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole other culture that's built around this whole thing. Yeah. Right. Whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did she come to the attention of somebody? Is there any background on that? Did I miss that, or...? I don't know if the no. Times released how she became the focus. The the person who's now public public advocate, her name's Tish Letitia, and she said that she's been on the forefront uh, complaining about the housing that the child live in Auburn housing, and um, let's not go there because that <laughs> she, right. Yeah. So, but I don't she, know how that yeah. child. So was yeah, so I mean the the reporter says that she was she was uh she was hanging out in front of the the um. This the the the, home, the shelter, um, and um, just talking to people, and somebody said, "You want to tell a story uh, that that family likes to talk a lot," <laughs> and she <laughs> and she took and she took a walk with them, and uh, you know that's how she started interviewing them. So, yeah, you know, it's just she's like finding somebody who's willing to let their story be told. I think is is what happened, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So that seemed pretty genuine to me. That's, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I and and it does impress me that this long form stuff suggests how we all could 
be thinking about you know telling teacher stories too. That, I mean, the short stuff and the blogging and all that's really important, but maybe there's something about getting you know more detailed stories out there too. Would be worth thinking about. So that's my last thought. Anybody else have a final thought this evening? I Chris, enjoyed it. I'm <laughs> good. Thank you for coming out, Chris. Was there anything else in the chat room that we might have gotten to? Um, I I think we the stuff I noticed I think we're actually good, but there was a lot that I missed. And Mary okay. Mary Beth has been pretty prolific there, and I think we need to have her talk a little more on another show. Well, we will, <laughs> Mary Beth. Thank you for coming by. You have any final thoughts? Um, and, and we do publish that uh, with alongside the the video here, so we'll get okay. that. Out. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I guess my last thoughts would be that at night I I say my prayers and they're often things I wish for and and much like Marina you know I was very moved by this child's story not just because of her story but because it is a reflection of every student who's ever been in my classroom mm -hmm. and at night when I pray for myself and my own wisdom and capacities as a teacher and a parent and a human being I often call out my students' names because in my church we believe when we when we vocalize it, you know, it, it helps make it true and more more real in the world. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading her story, I would stop once in a while and recall students I had five years ago or nine years ago. So the power of Dasani's story for me was the power of eleven years of teaching and each of the human beings that I've been blessed to know, even when I didn't necessarily count them as a blessing when I had them in my classroom. <laughs> right. and, and so mm -hmm. for me, it's been, um, it's been helping me focus on the idea that I teach people, and they bring stuff with them, and I bring stuff with them, and where can we connect in a place that isn't motivated merely by my evaluations? Yeah. Thank you. I, <laughs> that, uh, that, that for me is the theme of what I've been thinking. Like, they bring stuff and we bring stuff, and how do we meet um, is uh, the big theme in, in a lot of thinking we've been doing. Um, so thank you for making that really clear. Um, anybody else? Any final thoughts? Uh, the story yeah, really Stephanie, prompted. Thank you. Yeah, yeah um, the story really prompted me to to think about my role as um, the chair of the North Carolina English Teachers Association and to write what I think is a pretty bold call for proposals this year around um, advocacy and activism for our students and for ourselves as teachers. Um, yeah, I think I think now's the time. Um, so I'm I'm eager to see what what happens this year with um, our state organization and and how this piece might might be a catalyst for some important work here in North Carolina. Very cool. Thank you all. Um, I think we have a couple of guys from Kentucky coming who are farmers. We have to confirm that, Chris, but right. I think we're close to that. And then we have uh, next week, and then the week after that we'll be having some teachers from Oakland um, on as well. So. Got a couple shows planned. Um, come back here every Wednesday night. Thank you all for being here. The uh, Teachers Teaching Teachers is uh, broadcast over the edtechtalk.com uh, network or channel of the World Bridges Network. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank nice you. to meet everyone. Thank, Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Good night. Good night. Good night.